on his way. Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucker, he's on his way. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Listener discretion is advised. The show contains graphic language and depictions of violence. It may not be suitable for all audiences. We say fuck a lot. Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Sassy Dylan. Is that your costume? Yeah, that's what I'm going to be for Halloween. That's what you're, you're going to just be sassy? Yeah, I'm going to be sassy and like knock drinks out of people's hands and be like, oh, you just got knocked over. You're working Halloween, so I don't really, are you going to knock over people's like bottled water at work? Oh no, we're going to have drinks. Man, Halloween sucks this year. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. We've been talking about it. I think it's time to discuss it with the public. Well, it's really depressing. I mean, obviously, we're all stuck inside. COVID sucks. 2020 sucks. I look forward all year to Halloween. It's the one time of year I can be myself. Yeah, you really do enjoy (laughs) the entire month. I do. All the scary movies, the talk of the undead, and all all that stuff just really excites you. And we really haven't been able to do much of the Halloween stuff this year. Haunted houses, corn maze, that type of thing. It's just kind of been out the window. Man, I'll tell you what, the um, just another victim of 2020. I know. I'm, I'm just, is 2021 going to be worse? Let's hope not. On a positive note, it is Halloween week. So maybe you have some exciting tricks up your sleeves. Maybe some treats. Yeah, well, hopefully everyone can get together, stay safe, and still have a little bit of fun. I did see an amazing church sign that I want to turn into a t-shirt. It said, if Satan offers you a treat, it's a trick. Boom. Yeah, I want that shirt. Wouldn't that be great, like on a t-shirt? I'm going to make this design. Well, I think that's incredible, and that actually makes me want to go to that church. It actually just makes me want to know what Satan's treat is. Well, I'm going to guess it's like (laughs) fast women and all the drugs you can do. This sounds like, yeah, I need to be part of that. (laughs) I want to go to hell and hang out. That's where all the cool people's at. Well, that's where I'll be. So you can come sit next to me and we'll talk shit about everybody. Okay, that's what we do in public. (sighs) It's true. Man, we took a road trip to Atlanta and did not have a successful time. Well, There were so many people out and about. You can't go shopping. They have like... Lines, people are waiting in lines, like wrapping around the side of buildings to get in stores and such. Yes, everywhere you go, there's a line outside. And that is my, uh, my, I hate waiting in line or yeah, waiting to too. get in a restaurant or Especially anything. Especially when it starts raining and you're yeah. standing outside waiting in a line. And you can't even dip in somewhere to wait the rain out. Our ATL trip was a bust, I will just say. It was a total bust, but the mall of Georgia is still an actual full-fledged mall. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Don't you think? Well, yeah. I mean, there's still malls, Dylan. Well, yeah, but what the, I'm telling you but what the... But the 80s mall cu- culture has just, like, fallen by the wayside. I feel like they still got a taste of it there at the Mall of Georgia. Don't you? Maybe a little bit. I mean, there was the food court. It seemed like it was happening. I don't know. Back in the day, remember when going to the mall was, like, a big deal? And you could hang out at the arcade, and there were, like, lots and lots of other kids and teenagers there. Uh, yeah. And it was fun. It was, like, a really social activity. And nowadays, it's like, kids are missing out on some of the fun that we had back in the day. Or maybe we're just old. I don't know. Well, I think they're suffering from the same thing we are. You know, some damn phones. Yeah, it's yeah, true. You can't hang out. Everybody's looking at their damn phone. We tried to make our kids watch Rocky Horror Picture Show tonight. I don't think they were feeling it. They are not Frankie fans. Well, I don't know if it was the movie or if it was us singing and acting out in the entire movie as it was playing. Well, what can I say? I'm a Frankie fan. <laughs> in just seven days, I can run your kids out of the living room. Yeah, I was actually in a stage production of Rocky Horror a few years ago. This you- is like the second time I've been in Rocky Horror, and there may or may not be a video floating around somewhere out there on YouTube. Oh my God, we can I put sing and dance. We can put that video on Patreon for our patrons. Uh, maybe we'll yeah. think about it. No, totally, that's happening. So I'm really into it, and know like all the lyrics, and want to sing, and Dylan's like all into it as well. And then the kids are both just like, <sighs> I 
I think they were literally saying as if with their body language, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I know. What are we going to do with this generation if they're not Rocky Horror fans? I, I don't know. Are the cult showings at midnight when everybody's dressed up and acting the movie out and having just a great big old, big old time? Taking a virgin run around the theater? I is mean, that, come on. Is that going to die? I hope not. We must rally around this. Okay, so in the spirit of saving Halloween, you have a spooky story to tell us, well, right? Well, I do. And before we get started, if you want to join us for more spooky stories, patreon.com slash mountain murders podcast. Right now, if you sign up for an annual membership, you get a 5% discount. Well, that's a significant savings. Save money and support the podcast. We love you guys and would appreciate that. And on Wednesdays, we drop our mini episode show. We call it Offbeat. Look for it. Our first Offbeat dropped last Wednesday. And I may, may I say, I may or may not have had two to three beers before we uh, recorded Which, that. She allowed me to have a beer. He says two to three beers, but what that really means is he had like six. Because he just, he'll, he'll count like a tall boy as like one beer. And I'm like, well, technically that's like two beers. Well, no, I don't know where it's written down. The size of beers is like a, a standard measurement. But if I have two empty cans, I had two beers. He had like four beers or six beers that night. But anyway. So yeah. anywho. He's a little loopy on the episode. It's kind of funny. She allows me to let my hair down in the middle of the week. So just in time for Halloween, our story today takes place in Fall River, Massachusetts, 90 years after Lizzie Borden. And we'll get into that here in a minute. It's a case of sex, slaughter, and Satanism. Oh, my God. Thanks to our lovely patron and friend Stephanie, she suggested this case, and wowee. Thanks, Stephanie. It's a good one. I'm telling you, our patrons and our listeners alike, they have they have the some good true crime chops. I was sitting on this case for a while, saving it they for have, Halloween season. I think that's perfect. That was a good call on your part. Yeah. That's why you're the showrunner and the producer and the writer. And the star. So you're like basically telling me I'm like the, the the Larry David of Curb Your Enthusiasm? You're the crew. Thanks. Of this podcast. I just wish I had a roadie. Well, I can be um, co-star. I and need a roadie to like recruit hot babes to bring backstage. Oh, wait. Can I, I be the roadie? No. Or can I be the hot babe they bring backstage no. to meet you? No. No? No. Okay. You have to be the person that picks all the yellow M&Ms out of my bowl of candy. I would do that. And I'm like, excuse me, I would like a bowl of M&Ms, no yellows, please. And then you have to be the one that picks all those out. I would do that because I would eat them as I picked them out. And then I need 99 red balloons in my dressing room. Now, can you believe, could you believe that some people do that? I, I mean, would do that. How full of yourself do you have to be like to do shit like Are that? Are you kidding? I would live my life to be that kind of asshole diva. You would not. Oh, fuck yeah, I would. Oh my God, you would. It would be amazing. I'd be like, I need 99 red balloons in here. I need a framed original Die Hard poster. Oh, okay. Now you're stealing my ideas. I need a bowl of M&Ms with no yellows. Okay. In every green room, every dressing room that you use. Yes. Okay. And I would like a mime in the corner. See, now this is affecting someone else's life. I think he's that's getting the mime is getting paid. He or she's getting paid to mime in the corner. I don't know what the problem is. Well, that's true. They probably don't have steady gigs, honestly. All right. So back to our story. <laughs> we're getting off. We're getting off track, Dylan. Rut row. We're getting derailed by Dylan. Oh, my God. So the new age may have dawned in the 1960s, but the spiritual awakening would lead to something of an existential crisis for many. Those free spirits of the counterculture would find themselves involved in drugs, living in communes, or on the fringes of religious groups. Eastern mystics, Christianity, neo-pagan, and even Satanism on a path of self-discovery and higher purpose. By the late 1970s, the national landscape and the 60s ideals of free love had passed. The country was in an economic recession punctuated by unemployment and rising crime rates. Once thriving areas found themselves destitute with economic void. Yeah, this like in New York City would be a tough time to live there during this period because crime was basically out of control. I mean, 
everything's falling off city services you got the um the oil crisis and the gas rationing which is uh you pointed out the other day we don't feel those kinds of um as a society now we don't like give up things for we don't make sacrifices for like a greater good yeah we as a society have become very spoiled we are, even though these long, you know, wars carrying on and on for decades, and it does, how does it really even affect us? I mean, we're what, Gen X, I guess? We're on the tail end of that. I mean, we're 80s kids, 90s teenagers. Yes, we're showing our age a little bit here. But we, in our lifetime, haven't really experienced a time when we've had to sacrifice anything. Right. You know, like our parents, our grandparents, I mean, they grew up in these times where, in the 70s, everybody drove those big gas-guzzling cars Probably got what, like fifteen miles to a, to a gallon or something. Maybe. And then they were being rationed and had to wait in line for hours and hours to be given like five gallons of gas. Yeah, well, we've I, just never really known that. No, we haven't known that, and uh, I think that I think it shows. We've had some economic hardships, perhaps in different ways than those generations before us, but I don't know. I don't think we've really ever had to give up a whole lot. Well, and I think someone out there is screaming at their head, you know, their phone right now. I couldn't freely wipe my ass for the first two months of this pandemic, you son of a well, bitch. Well, there's that. Yeah, we we did have to do without some toilet paper for a while. And it's good to know that there are people just uh, automatically hoard up resources at that point instead of helping their neighbors out. What a shitty situation. Oh, my God. Our story truly begins October 13th of 1979 with a dead body. Is that a good opener, Dylan? Well, that's a good place to start most true crime stories. A teenage girl is found with her hands bound underneath the bleachers at Dim Regional Vocational High School. Her skull was crushed, and the body is eventually identified as that of 17-year-old Doreen Levesque. She's a teenage runaway who'd been living in a New Bedford foster home. She had been working as a prostitute in the Fall River Red Light District. Doreen had been bound with twine and fishing line and bludgeoned with a blunt object, like perhaps a rock. And she had also been stabbed in the back of the head. Wow. I mean, could you imagine finding some poor girl in that that condition? Yeah, I believe joggers actually found her at this high school. Joggers and hunters find everyone. They do. That's why I say just don't go hunting and don't be a jogger. If you just sit on the couch, being a fat ass, like myself, I've never found a dead body. Well, there's fishermen, too. I should should include fishermen. (laughs) Some investigation into Doreen's childhood found she was a troubled teenager, rebellious, and she had some behavior issues since she was young. Her parents were eventually ordered to send the girl to a foster home because she had ran away multiple times. But she ran away again from the foster home, and took to the Fall River streets to become a sex worker. Doreen was unlike most of the sex workers. She was a freelance worker. She didn't have a pimp. Oh, wow. Which at that time in this area was uncommon. Fall River's claim to fame was likely one of the most notorious murder mysteries in U.S. history, as I mentioned previously, the Lizzie Borden case. Well, and I think that was very sensationalized, very na- nationwide story back then. If you do live under a rock and you're asking yourself, who's Lizzie Borden? Well, in 1892, Lizzie Borden was accused of murdering her father and stepmother with an axe. 40 wax. She was eventually acquitted and their murder remains unsolved. But like you said, Dylan, it's become an international sensation. You know, her home that she moved to after she was acquitted and such recently went up for sale. Yes, I do know that. It's not the original house where the murder took place. So I wouldn't want that home. Sorry. So as you mentioned, international sensation, completely sensationalized story. And it even sparked a children's rhyme. Do you know that rhyme, Dylan? It sounded like perhaps you did. Oh, uh, no. I mean, I couldn't do it. Lizzie Borden took an axe. Gave her father 40 wax when she saw what she had done. Gave her mother 41 or something like that. Dude, I think that's it. That may be a little off. It may be the mother got 40 and he got 41. I'm not sure, but something along those lines. You know, kids' nursery rhymes and little things they said in the schoolyards back were um, pretty dark. Yeah. Right? Like, isn't Red Roses, Red Roses, uh, isn't that basically about the plague? Red Roses. Yeah. Red Roses, um... 
pocket full of poses, posies, it's the flowers that keep the smell away. Ashes, ashes, we well, all call them. Yeah. Oh, it's I about didn't know the that. plague, bro. Well, I always thought the rockabye burned the bodies. The rockabye baby rhyme or whatever was yeah. fucking weird. It's like, oh, when the bow breaks, the baby will fall, and yeah. it's like, oh, cool, and it and what like fucking breaks its neck. Awesome, sing that to me when I'm two. And gets a traumatic head injury and becomes a serial killer. Yeah, or it's like a school shooter. Full circle. Now the Lizzie Borden house stands on 2nd Street, and it became a draw for dark tourists who want to spend the night in the now bed and breakfast where the double murder took place. Fall River is located in Bristol County, Massachusetts, and considered the 10th largest city in the state. So roughly about 88,000 people or so live in Fall River. In the 19th century, the city became famous for its textile manufacturing. Rich in history, the city dates back to the 1600s when the original members of the Plymouth Colony settled into the area, which they called Freetown. So, yeah, that's up in that area. That so much history there. One of the very first areas settled at all by the Europeans, right? In the 1870s, there was a boom in the area where they added 22 mills and 15 new corporations. Wow. And the overall mill capacity doubled to more than 1 million spindles in two, in two years' time. Oh, is that making yarn or something? Yeah, well, they made textiles. Oh, so, yeah, the, oh, I mean, that's clothing, just cloths. fucking tons of fabric being produced in this town. And by 1876, the city had one-sixth of all New England cotton capacity and one-half of all print cloth production. Wow. Right? Thousands of Irish and French-Canadian immigrants flooded the city. Tenement housing was slapped up in Fall River to house the influx of workers who were hoping to earn a decent living. But by the Great Depression, many of the mills had gone bankrupt and closed. On February 2nd, 1928, the worst fire ever, basically in like Fall River history, swept through this recently vacated Pocasset Mill, and it wiped out a pretty huge portion of downtown. Wow. It was like a massive fire. And by the 1960s, the face of Fall River had dramatically changed. It was no longer a textile town. Jobs had fallen away, leaving behind a lot of unemployed people struggling to find work. Drugs, alcoholism, and prostitution moved in. And by the late 70s, Fall River was known as a place where sex workers could make money. Fall River still has a reputation of being one of the most violent cities in New England. So I'm just curious. I'm not even trying to be funny. Who were their patrons? Who was coming to f- purchase sex work or the drugs? Which, you know, those when the, when an area fall, falls in this kind of disarray completely through the entire system, yeah, I guess you do get influxes from people outside the area who come there to, you know, buy your wares, if you will. Well, people were coming into town. Professionals were driving in from Boston. You had people from out of state. I mean, it was kind of known as like almost like a red light district. So you had people coming there because they knew they could get what they wanted. Oh, that's crazy. And like I said, Fall River still has a reputation of being one of the most violent cities in New England. And you might ask me, why does this history lesson matter? Because we need to understand the climate in Fall River to gain perspective of this bizarre, true crime tale. It really kind of sets the stage for everything that's about to happen. So the Levesque killing left investigators baffled. Initially, they thought the young sex worker was likely murdered by one of her clients. However, the county medical examiner determined that the murder had likely been committed by multiple people, and the forensic evidence seemed to suggest a ritualistic motive for the crime. The trail of blood would soon lead investigators on a much darker path. Wow, I bet... Everyone was was beside themselves when you know when she was discovered and word started spreading around of how she was you know found and all the stuff done to her. So I'm sure there was quite, quite an uproar. Then January 26th of 1980, a woman named Barbara Raposa's body was found in a wooded area behind a printing plant. The 22-year-old woman, like Levesque, had her head crushed with some kind of blunt object and her hands were bound behind her back. A man with dogs discovered her body. Nearby were chunks of concrete, some pieces broken, 
So that left investigators speculating that perhaps the concrete had been used to um, bludgeon her. Man, what an evil way to kill someone. Just keep bashing them in the head with a... Yeah, it's yeah, I know. She was wearing a bra and a blouse. Other clothes were found by her body. And it was three months before Raposa's body was found that her boyfriend, a man named Andre Maltius, I can't, I'm sorry, guys, Maltius of New Bedford had reported her missing. Now, on the evening of November 7th, 1979, a man named David Cowan had picked up Raposa and her infant son, Eric, at her apartment in Fall River. The pair left Eric at a babysitter's house. Then they attended a movie and had dinner at a restaurant in Fall River. Barbara needed money, so she asked Cowan to drop her off on a street in Fall River. She told David she'd meet him later at a specific bar in town. So she goes out, and she's basically working the streets during this time. Right. And so he waits around at this bar until about one in the morning, and intermittently he's kind of stepping out of the bar, like checking for her on the street, and he doesn't see her anywhere. And she never shows up. So he's just kind of like, okay, well, maybe she got busy, I guess, right? Oh, she's getting busy, <laughs> bruh. Well, the next day, her father reports her missing to the Fall River Police Department. When her boyfriend, this, we'll call him Andy, that's what he goes by, Andy Maltius, he's the boyfriend, and I use that term loosely, he also reported her missing. And police took notice. Um, Andy was, in fact, her ex-boyfriend. He was a drug addict and a convicted sexual predator. I mean, the guy's like a rapist and a pedophile. Oh, my God. He was known to prey on and frequent the underage sex workers in Fall River's Red Light District. Now, first thing Andy tells police when they finally start talking to him about his missing girlfriend is that he's a boarding in Christian, which strikes them as odd. Yeah. The first thing, you know, when you meet somebody and they say, I'm a born-again Christian. I mean, it's just a little unusual. Then he rambles on about Barbara's involvement in Satanism and that he has information relating to another unsolved murder, Doreen Levesque. Oh, so now I bet their ears are perking up. Well, they absolutely are. So with no other leads in the case, they want a formal interview with Andy. Once I worshipped Satan, he told them, holding up a small Bible, but now I worship Jesus. That is how he begins his interview with detectives. Well, I will say that's a 180 in his position there, but um, I'm sure the cops are just like, what the hell is this guy going to talk about? He told investigators that he and Barbara were once members of a satanic cult in Fall River and that Doreen Levesque was also involved. So... He's opening up and, and and talking about a satanic cult, and 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 they're probably wondering to themselves, is he full of shit? Wouldn't that be your first thought as an investigator? Yes. Well, then he starts telling them he's psychic and he has this vision of Barbara's body and starts like leading investigators on this very strange journey. <laughs> Oh, my God, that's not helping his credibility any. He arranges a meeting for police to talk to two other cult members, Karen Marsden and Robin Murphy. And by this point, whispers of a satanic cult in Fall River were not so uncommon. Law enforcement had received multiple tips that members of the community, mostly sex workers, were participating in a satanic cult that included weekly meetings and rituals. Oh, an undercover detective named Paul Carey was sent to infiltrate one of the satanic meetings. They were held in a woman's apartment in what was considered like project housing called Harbor Terrace. Oh, so he's going to figure he's going to infiltrate find the you know the the structure of this um cult and take it down. Well, just trying to figure out what's going on. Or just Probably just like, come on, guys. They're probably kidding around about this. Like, oh, who's got satanic cult duty tonight? Right. Well, inside her apartment, a devil mural was painted on the wall. Carrie Check. took a six-pack. He was trying to blend in with the attendants. And he basically witnessed this entire satanic meeting. Now, Barbara Raposa had attended meetings at this particular apartment. Also, 
known to law enforcement, was a criminal named Carl Drew. He was also in attendance with a teenager named Robin Murphy and a woman named Karen Marsden. Now, he knew something was really strange, and this is the Detective Carey, when he heard a deep male voice coming from a bedroom. It sounded really low, gravelly, and demonic. Oh, my God. So curious, he peeks inside, and this is when he saw that the only persons in the room was the 17-year-old teenage girl named Robin Murphy and another female. So who was making the voice? Robin Murphy. The voice was booming from Murphy's mouth, and there was some sort of chanting going on, and then lots of Hail Satans shouted. All right. So he was immediately like, huh? As he's, like, watching this teenage girl, and he hears, like, you know, I want to kill her, or something, whatever, coming out of her mouth. Oh, my God. Is that what, is yeah, that what he Yeah, I don't heard? know. I would have to smoke a lot of cigarettes, like the, the chick who did the voice in The Exorcist. Yeah, that was know. rough on her vocal cords. Yeah. So, Andy tells investigators that he has this psychic dream, as I mentioned, of this crime scene. And he describes in detail where her body is located and what had been done to her. So investigators, knowing he seemed to have too much psychic ability, arrested him and charged him with Barbara Raposa's murder. Oh, okay. So they're basically like, yeah, the psychic ability bullshit's not going to fly, but you know details about the crime scene. Andy confessed to having been involved in the satanic cult, as you know, and during his confession, he admitted he had been involved with a teenager named Robin Murphy, the same teenager who attended the satanic meetings, and he had been involved with her since she was 11 years old. Okay, so there's another reason for you to be in jail? Yeah, he admits that he'd been in a long-running relationship with Robin Murphy, but he ended that so he could be with Barbara Raposa. That's very noble of him. Well, this is leaving detectives with a lot of questions, and they start digging into some of the players in the story. Robin Murphy, the 17-year-old teenager involved in the cult, was also a part-time sex worker and pimp. She was known to be incredibly street smart with a strong personality. Murphy had been sexually abused since childhood by Andy, and she would later state that she was 11 years old, she was hitchhiking, and got picked up by him, and he told her at the time he was going to have sex with her. If she told anybody, he would kill her. Well, that's horrible. sexual abuse continued, and by 13, Robin Murphy was seeing other guys. She says Andy would beat her up, drag her out of the back seats of cars, and threaten the guys. So she was working the streets from a pretty early age. Well, yeah, so she's abused at 11 over and over. This dude's going around, you know, acting like they had a relationship. You know, that's sick and twisted. And, yeah, I mean, of course, she's she's going to go down one path or the, or the other. So I'm not surprised at all that she would go into sex work, you know, get with I mean, at least she could choose who she gets to be with. Well, the thing is... Each time the minor was working, I mean, she was actually being abused by an adult. Yes, exactly. Which is a part of the story that seems to get lost. I mean, she's a fucking child. That's disgusting. And by 17, Robin had moved in with a woman named Sunny who lived in the Harbor Terrace apartment. And this is where the devil worshiping, like, took place. The apartment with the big devil mural. Robin claimed that the offer to stay at the apartment came with strings. She had to prostitute in order to live there. So you got to pay your way, I guess? Robin had troubles from an early age. Her mother and stepfather had taken her at one point to see a psychiatrist who administered a personality test. And the doctor noted Robin seemed to answer the test in a very manipulative way, as if to make sure she wasn't going to be diagnosed with anything. Oh, so she's been careful about her answers and... Well aware. Very cunning. I mean, they say from an early age, she was cunning, calculating, and manipulative. She really knew how to work people. Well, and I think she gained those um, skills, if you will, from being abused at an early age and kind of having to look out for everybody. Right. But I think some of that even was before the abuse started. Oh, maybe that's why she's so good at it. The attitude of law enforcement at the time is disheartening. I mean, they know the Bedford Street area is where these sex workers, drug dealers, and pimps hang out. And the same cops are often frequenting the bars that are on the street. 
And it never seems to occur to them that not only is this criminal activity happening, but many of these sex workers are young minor girls. I mean, these girls are victims. Well, I mean, you, you'd you have to be able to tell that some of these girls are quite young. And, and that's just where it's a breakdown in the system. You know, that's where social workers and, you know, you, these programs where you kind of have more uh, longer interactions with these corner kids or whatever you want to call them. That's where those types of programs really help a, a, a town. Friends who knew Robin said she was vicious, calculating, and she liked to hurt people. Some even said she scared them. Those who knew her out, uh, you know, on the street claimed that Robin would make threats that she'd break their jaw or kill them. <laughs> My God. Robin had a strange relationship with a woman named Karen Marsden. So 20-year-old Karen was not like the other girls in her circle or the other women in the circle. Karen was sweet. She was a tender woman, and she had a young child. Her problem was she struggled with addiction, and that led her to be involved in prostitution. And people living tough lives on the streets, um, you know, they seem to just kind of go through their day, but it really impacted Karen. Well, damn, that's that's so sad. I mean, she was very aware of, like, what was going on around her and, like, this isn't normal. And she felt very guilty because she was unable to care for her young child. But she had given him up to a foster family. Like, she had enough understanding to say, hey, I'm not in a place to take care of my son. I want him to have the best life possible. So she gave him to this foster family. But she frequently visited him and was in involved in his life. Like well, she had a really good relationship with his foster parents, was allowed to be part of his life. And that's good. And I commend her. That must have been, a, you know, to make that choice. But she did the right thing, you know, as far as her a child's concerned. And that takes a lot of strength to do something like that. Karen lived with her grandmother. And though she was on the streets at times and she was struggling with the drug problems, Karen was in touch every day with her family. If she was not coming home, she would let her grandmother know. And she was, like, always checking in. So she's not this calloused over, jaded, you know, kind of just going along with it and, you know, just kind of checked out, staying high all the time. She was processing all this along the way. And that seems even so scarier and more sad to me than the not, not discounting the other people around her, but. Some reports describe Karen and Robin as best friends. Others describe them as lovers. But it seems that regardless of their relationship, Karen was afraid of Robin. From February to November of 1979, Karen was working as a prostitute for a pimp named Carl Drew. Carl Drew is an active member of the satanic cult. Some even called him the cult leader. Let's talk a little bit about Carl. So Carl Drew was born in New Hampshire in 1954 to a poor farming family. Carl's father was abusive and punished his son by making him participate in animal butchering. Okay. The family had a slaughter pit where they discarded animal remains. And in one incident, Carl was forced to butcher a horse. Wow. When he refused... Carl was beaten and thrown into the pit with the rotting carcasses, which, I mean, that has to be intensely traumatic for anyone. Yeah, that's horrible. But I it mean, really fucked him up. I under, understand the need for a gut pit, but no one should be flung down into the damn thing. Childhood abuse, as we all know, um, just, I'm no psychiatrist or, uh, you know, whatever, but it does increase chances of criminal activity. I mean, I think we all know that. We've well, seen it yeah. time and time again. Yep. And Carl Drew is no exception. Drew becomes a biker and a pimp in Fall River. He is an associate of a biker game called the Sidewinders, a biker gang, and they are affiliated with Hell's Angels. Carl Drew decks out in black leather boots, black leather jackets. He has knuckle tats that spell out hate. That's so original. He had other satanic tattoos. He has one that says, like, Satan's Avenger with a picture of the devil. He started out in minor criminal activities, but then soon realized that recruiting sex workers in the Bedford Street area was the easiest way to make cash. Carl also reckoned that violence was necessary, so he was in and out of jail for charges like armed robbery and assault. And though he had dropped out of the eighth grade and had run away from home, he also had the streetwise intelligence, much like Robin Murphy. 
He was analytic, creative, and had the situational awareness, which was very important qualities for living on the mean streets. Carl was described as cruel, fearsome, and unforgiving. His anger was often directed at the women who worked for him. They were threatened and usually beaten by him. Wow, he sounds like a real catch. Yeah, he sounds like a fucking asshole. Yeah, I was just wondering how that would work on his Tinder profile. All those, you're you're explaining, you know, what he really went through and how cruel and you know abusive he'd become. But then those, what do, were those attributes you said there about being cunning and that's how it would read on Tinder. Cunning, creative. Yeah, thinks outside the box. Situational awareness. A real go getter. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out he's a. A biker pimp who ro- arm robs people. Yeah, and actually, he ends up being kicked out of that biker gang because of his pimping. I mean, they say pimping ain't easy. It's not. I think we all know that. But um, so they they took they took offense to his pimping, or was he not biker enough? Well, I guess the pimping might have taken away from his biker activities, so they eventually like kicked him out of the bike club. Oh my god! They're like, dude. you can't sit with us at the lunch table. That's pretty awesome to be, you know, doing so many criminal activities that the bikers kick you out of the I'm club. I'm such a pimp. I was kicked out of the Sidewinders. Yeah, I think that could be a good rap lyric. In February of 1978, Carl Drew had this violent encounter with a John, and I should mention this. It just kind of just shows like how cuckoo he is. So the John was assaulting one of Carl's sex workers. He hears her screams and bursts into the apartment. The John was strangling her. So Carl Drew tackles the man, starts beating him. And then the man happens to fall or maybe was thrown down a set of stairs at the apartment. So by this time, law enforcement has been called and Carl Drew finds himself trying to escape. But he's in the midst of a blizzard. Oh, my God. He gets away. Ends up stealing a snowmobile, trying to get himself to Canada in the snowstorm. He just all of a sudden decided he was going to run to Canada on a snowmobile. He eventually is arrested. However, the John, who was hospitalized, ends up dying from his injuries. So they get Carl. They've arrested him. Murder charges. Well, you know, um, that guy was beating that woman up and strangling her, the John. So, I mean, that's not cool. So I kind of didn't feel bad for him getting his ass kicked real good, but, you know, that kind of sucks that he died, right? Well, the autopsy showed the man was a heavy drug user, so the charges are dropped against Drew because they couldn't prove that he actually killed the man. It could have been due to the amount of drugs in his system. Oh. And, oh, well, he fell, he was high, what have you. Yeah, we don't know if it was the drugs or the 20 stairs he was flung down or the severe beating. We're not sure what happened. Well, Carl spent time at Charlie's and Pier 14, which is bars on the Bedford Street area. And that's where he first meets Karen Marsden. So she starts working for him. And by summer of 1979, Karen has befriended Robin Murphy and others who were participating in Carl's satanic meetings. Karen was reticent. I mean, she grew up Catholic and she'd always believed in God. So she was a little uneasy about all of this. But she soon finds herself... In the middle of this, like, underground cult. Well, you know, no matter what, I I think just the, um, ah, what's the word I'm looking for? Just kind of the. Is it like maybe the peer pressure? Well, the anarchist vibe, like, or the taboo element of something participating in something like that. it's kind of intriguing, maybe. It's like the lure of, like. Yeah. Ooh, this is something I shouldn't be doing. Well, no one else. All of my friends are doing it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I could see you. Ending up in a group of damn knuckleheads. This sounds like a motley crew, to say the least. Definitely. Let's pause for a moment and hear from our sponsor today, Dylan. Drew held seances, satanic meetings, and performed rituals through the warm weather months at Freetown State Forest. Then when the weather turned cold, they moved into the Harbor Terrace apartment. Now, during the meetings, attendees described a human skull being passed around and blood being used to perform various rituals. During these rituals, Carl Drew allegedly spoke in tongues, conjured demons, and offered human sacrifices. You know, I don't, I wonder if he's doing any of the real, you know, techniques of LaVey. Some of the spells and such. Because a lot of that stuff sounds like hard work. You got to put in some time, effort. You don't just utter a couple of phrases and 
drink some blood. It doesn't really work like that. Well, I kind of get into that in a, in a few minutes. Oh, okay. So we'll talk a little bit more about that Oh, later. I'm postulating. By October of 1979, Karen Marsden finds herself in too deep. Now, according to Marsden, she and Robin Murphy were ordered by Carl Drew to recruit a young woman, Doreen Levesque. Levesque is working Bedford Avenue without a pimp, and Carl Drew wanted her to work for him. So the women approached Doreen and asked her if she wanted to get high. So, yeah, I mean, if you're a pimp and you see this chick down here, independent contractor, if you will, she's going to cause you, even if she doesn't come work for you and you don't get her money as well, which is a benefit, these other girls are going to be like, well, look, she's getting to keep all the money. So that kind of knowledge, or if you will, that spreads and is dangerous. So he's got to take over her, bring her into the fold. Carl Drew wanted her to come work for him, as I mentioned. So they ask her, hey, do you want to go get high? Carl, Doreen, Karen, and Robin go someplace, and they're smoking pot, and they start discussing this business opportunity. Hey, you can come work for me. So he sent the A-team. I'm the big daddy pimp. Pimps keep, you know, tiers of women. They got the A, B, C. Uh, Yep. So he sent the A-team to befriend her and kind of just talk about how good their pimp is, how he kicks people's asses when they mess with them, how they give them 80% of the revenue and they don't have to worry about how it's spent, how awesome it is to have a pimp. And in the morning, he'd be making you waffles. Yeah, and then you got to do his nails and all that stuff. Doreen tells Carl she doesn't want to work for him. She's fine being a freelancer. I can see you being a freelancer, too. You just have independent thought, and I don't think you could justify giving someone up your hard-earned money. Well, thank you for that. You're welcome. I I think I would fancy myself being more of like the dominatrix sex worker, though. I just want to be mean to men. Okay. And abuse them. Well, there's some people that need that. Yeah, I know. So that's what I would do. And no, I don't think I would need a pimp for that. So this is when he binds her with a fishing wire. So they tie her up, they stab her in the head, and then they stone her with rocks. What the hell? At this time, Drew tells Karen Marsden, you've sold your soul to the devil with this sacrifice. All right. You're in the club. Yay. High five. Cool. Congratulations. Could you let me know we were going to murder this poor woman earlier? I mean, what? Just because she won't join their their group. That's bullshit. Becoming increasingly repulsed and scared, Karen Marsden tries to sever her ties with Carl Drew. So during this time, she and Drew argue a lot back and forth about her involvement. He threatens to kill her. Go to the police. She goes into hiding. She moves in with Robin Murphy and a woman named Carol Fletcher. And soon after this, Karen is in contact with a Massachusetts state police officer regarding Doreen's murder. Because remember, Andy Maltius tells the story about this Barbara Raposa murder. And he's got these two women who know about what happened to Doreen. So he brings Karen and Robin in on this Doreen Levesque investigation. So she began spilling the beans about the murder, the cult, and Carl Drew. Oh, good. Robin is not very happy with Karen's confession to the cops. Being a hard-nosed street kid, Robin is a firm believer of snitches get stitches. So she just doesn't think you should help the cops, period, for any reason, and definitely shouldn't turn someone in. No. And during their police interviews, Karen did all the talking while Robin mostly scowled at her. I mean, she just was not pleased with this. Well, Robin doesn't sound like a team player. They left their connection to Andy fairly vague, although during trial, Robin would admit that he had been molesting her since she was 11. Now, detectives would remain in contact with Karen Marsden in the following weeks. Carl Drew certainly fit the profile of a savage killer, but there was nothing to link him to Doreen's murder. Detectives kept pressing Karen for more information, but she said she didn't have anything else to give them. And she told police if she were to turn up dead, it would be at the hands of Carl Drew. Marsden painted Drew much like Charles Manson. She told detectives she was a good person who believed in God. But she called Carl Drew the devil. 
Her narrative mirrored the Manson cult, as Drew organized a prostitution ring as the satanic coven that he ruled with intense fear. Carl Drew would threaten girls with the statement, Satan will take his toll. Oh my God. Which ignited fear in many of the women who worked for Drew. They thought he would kill them violently and their souls would be cast into a flaming pit of hell for all eternity. Man, I think my managers at work could use that against me. Cue the metal soundtrack. I'm going to try that next time someone doesn't do something I expect at work. You're just going to yell out Satan will take his toll? Yes. I think you should try it. I'm going to. I'm going to do that next time I'm in the grocery store and the line isn't moving fast enough. I'll you just kinda... shout. I'll <laughs> throw my can of olives on the ground and I'll be like, Satan will take his toll. You won't honor this 50 cent coupon on Hot Pockets? Hot Pockets. Satan will take his toll. Do you think the Dark Lord likes Hot Pockets? Well, I'm going to say he does because they are evil in their creation and design. But the more detectives interview Karen Marsden, the more they realize that Drew is not the only dangerous person in her life. As it turns out, Karen admitted that Robin had a dark side. Even before her involvement with the satanic cult, Robin had dabbled in the occult since she was a very young girl. Oh, in what way? Just an, a keen interest just a, in the yeah, occult, just, okay. reading, studying. I don't know, Dylan. Oh my gosh. I wonder if I can take that course. I want to take that course. Karen described Robin as psychologically unstable and prone to violence as well. Detectives are becoming more familiar with this murky cast of characters. Now, Carl spends December of 1979 and January of 1980 trying to find Karen because she went into hiding. She's in hiding. She's living in an apartment with Robin and this woman, Carol Fletcher. And the whole time she's talking to police. Oh, so is Robin off the grid with her? She's kind of in and out. Oh, okay. And Carl keeps putting out feelers. He's looking for her. I mean, everybody kind of knows it, but they're trying to keep it hush-hush. And he knows that she's hiding. He's assumed that she snitched, and he threatens to shoot her up with battery acid when he finds her. Yeah, why can't the cops, gosh, bring some charges. Get this guy off the street. On February 4th of 1980, Carl Drew tells Carol Fletcher, in the right time and right place, I'm going to kill Karen. Well, there's more threats. It is only four days later, on February 8th, that Carol, Karen, and Robin are riding along on Bedford Avenue when they see Carl Drew and a man named Carl Davis. The two Carls. Hi, Carl. Oh, my God. You know, this guy sounds like a horrible, scary person. He really does. But it's kind of hard to take him serious. Carl doesn't seem scary to me. I feel like, you know what? I like to whack Carl in the knee with a fucking bat. I like Carl as a name. I'm just saying it doesn't seem scary to me. So we've got the two Carls. Hi, <laughs> Carls. They get into the car and they tell Carol to drive to Family Beach in Westport. When they get to the beach area, Drew orders Robin to pull Karen out of the car by her hair, which Robin does. My God. Robin drags Karen into the woods. Carl Drew and Robin Murphy begin striking Karen with rocks. Carl Drew tells Robin to slit Karen's throat. Robin has a hunting knife, which she uses to cut between Karen's fingers through the hand to the wrist joint and severs her hand from the arm. My God, she, she basically split her hand all the way down to her wrist. Jesus yeah. Christ. Then he orders Robin Murphy to perform oral sex on Karen. And then says, you lezzies make me sick. Oh, God, that's, what, what a weirdo. Then Robin Murphy slashes Karen's throat. Carl Drew began stomping on her head until she's decapitated. He then starts kicking her head around like a football. How in the hell do you make someone's head come off by just stomping on it? I don't know. I'm not a head stomper. I mean, really? What the freaking hell? I know. They then carve an X in her chest, and Carl is chanting the whole time. When all is said and done, he smears Karen's blood on Robin's forehead and tells her, Now you're one of us. Okay. And according to Murphy, Drew then raped the headless corpse. I just can't even process all the horrible stuff you just said there in a row. 
I mean, really. Yeah, I know. It's really fucked up. I should have given like a trigger warning before I told everybody all that stuff. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty horrible. It's one of the most horrible things I've ever heard. Oh, it's really fucked up. With the, being humiliated, attacked, brutalized, and killed, all that at the same time. That's horrible. No, it is. On February 9th of 1980, Karen Marsden is reported missing. Two months later, in a grisly discovery, her skull would be found by a man who was clearing a land parcel near Duval Pond, which is in the beach town of Westport. A more detailed search of the area revealed her skull, but nothing else. There were some clumps of human hair, a high heel shoe, pieces of a woman's sweater, and jewelry that were discovered. But not her remains. Man. Before Marsden's skull was found, and as I mentioned, the rest of her was not, Robin Murphy decides to turn on Carl Drew and finger him for the murder. Sonny Sparta, who's the woman who owned the uh, the apartment where they were mostly practicing their satanic rituals and whatnot, Sonny contacts police, naming Robin Murphy as the killer of Karen Marsden. So when she finds out Karen is dead, she's like, Robin did this. And she tells investigators, hey, I was a former prostitute. I lived at Harbor Terrace. They were all active members of this cult. They were coming to my apartment. They used it on multiple occasions for these satanic gatherings. And I, once upon a time, had been lovers with Robin Murphy. And according to her, Robin admitted to her during a phone conversation, I was there, we killed Karen. Well, there you go. So Sonny is like, uh, yeah, I, I got to tell somebody this. I can't hold this in. Another woman named Carol Fletcher, who was along for the ride and witnessed this murder, she came forward to police and stated that Robin Murphy and Carl Drew had been involved in killing Karen Marsden. Fletcher admitted to driving the group out to the secluded wooded area where this satanic sacrifice took place. Well, it's, uh, he see, this guy is, is twisting uh, Carl Drew, is doing these violent, evil things, and then it's almost like, oh yeah, by the way, this fits into the satanic whatever stuff right i mean he's it's stuff he would have done anyway you know outside of his belief or whatever in satanism so yeah he's just an asshole that's another asshole thing he's doing he's using it like to kind of justify this stuff but that's not how it's, it's in reverse order robin murphy is placed into witness protection in texas while awaiting trial Later, she agrees to plead guilty to her role in the murders and turn state evidence in exchange for a life sentence. See, it sounds like the other girl was um, Christian or Karen. Karen was the Christian. She was just um, hiding out, but not like actively in protective custody. That's what it sounded like. Is that right? That's what that was the case. Yeah. That's how she still had contact with Robin and Robin's going back and forth kind of. With old Carl Drew, so yeah, that she should um, is too bad. She should have been been protected better, I think, or been like actually officially protected. But we're not done. So Carl Drew was convicted of the Karen Marsden murder and given life without the possibility of parole. Andy Maltius was given a life sentence for the murder of Barbara Raposa, and due to lack of evidence, no one was charged in the murder of Doreen Levesque. Carl Drew has published several write-ups on the internet since his incarceration. He has exhausted his appeals and has been denied a new trial. Now, this is what's so interesting. Carl says Robin Murphy is responsible for the three murders. And by her own admission during trial, Robin claimed she was in attendance at all three murders. According to Carl, on the evening of Karen Marsden's murder, Robin climbed into the window of a witness who testified at his trial and told the woman she'd better say Carl Drew was responsible, that he handed me the knife and ordered me to kill Karen. Oh, my God. So this witness fled to Washington State because she was so afraid to testify at the trial and was eventually found by state police, ordered to come back and testify. She was so scared she attempted suicide before the trial. The witness was given immunity by by police in order to get on the stand, and she later recanted her statements, but it was dismissed. The recanting of her statements? Yeah, like they basically have just ignored her recanting these statements. Now, Robin claimed she was involved in the Barbara Raposa murder, 
Andy had discovered Barbara was cheating on him with another man, and Robin claimed she was partying with Andy and Barbara on the night that Barbara was killed, and that they were just driving around the city, like, drinking and getting high. And at some point, the pair got into an argument. Andy parked behind an old factory. He drags Barbara out of the car and rapes her. She cried for help, so he started beating her first with his hands, then with some rocks. And afterwards, he drove away with Robin Murphy, leaving Barbara there in a pool of blood. My God. So that's Robin's story. But Carl Drew was like, wait a minute. She's claiming she was at all three of these murders. She intimidated this witness at my trial. The witness has even said later, no, it wasn't Carl Drew, and this is what Robin Murphy did, and it was just ignored. Well, it sounds like the state put a pretty big um, importance on that witness's statement and and their testimony. That's why they don't want to, you know, acknowledge the recanting, because then, you know, he can move forward, maybe an appeals process or something, and look back on that and be like, hey, this was the cornerstone of their case against me. Because it doesn't sound like there's any forensics. Or any of that stuff going on. Of course, it's back in the day. Now, we're going to talk about all of that. Oh, my gosh. A woman named Mildred Jukes, a.k.a. Cookie, testified against Carl Drew. She said threats of violence came from Drew frequently, and he had told her on one particular occasion that a sex worker who was arrested for prostitution had to pay, that he was going to kill her, tie her to a tree, sacrifice her, and pour warm blood from a live goat all over her face. Oh, okay. Well, none of that sounds okay. So that would scare me if someone threatened me with that. Others, including Detective Carey, and he's the guy who attended the satanic meetings undercover, he would later state publicly he believed it was all Robin Murphy, that she was responsible for the murders. He even submitted a write-up in a local newspaper about his belief. According to Detective Carey, Doreen was working for Carl, Now, Robin denies this and says that Doreen's refusal to work for Carl Drew was the reason for her murder. But official police files, I mean, they might know more than what we can find in research on the internet. His overall theory is that Robin Murphy was the ringleader for this cult. He theorized that Robin Murphy had feelings for Doreen Levesque and she became jealous because Doreen and Carl had a thing that Murphy... Robin Murphy killed Doreen out of jealousy and that Robin Murphy Murphy also killed Barbara Raposa out of jealousy because if you remember Andy Maltius left Robin Murphy for Barbara. Oh. Oh yeah. And also Murphy killed Karen because they had also been lovers. And Karen was at both murder scenes and knew too much. About wow, Robin so Robin Murphy's involvement. Yeah, so she could be wow. So, so this is a cop's could, theory. Well, yeah, and that he worked the case. He was at the ground level there with a, you know, the information pretty early on, you know, fresh information as it came in. So yeah, and then Robin's going back and forth with uh, Karen, and you know, and and then they just happen to find, you know, see dude when she's with her. She could be a manipulator setting all this up. Robin viewed Karen as a weak link because again, Karen's very sensitive. She's the one talking to police. She doesn't want to have any part of this cult, murder. Well, yeah, she's None over it. it. She yeah. just wants to be away from these people now. And she knows that she's talking to police. You know, she went with her. And, and they. Uh, it sounded like they interviewed them together, which is kind of weird. But, yeah, she had no intentions of letting Karen live. Also, when she was being interviewed about the murder of Doreen Levesque, Robin Murphy named two men in the murder. And then later admitted she didn't even know the men, and they were released. So no one was ever charged in Doreen's murder. Wow. Well, I guess they don't even know what to believe at this point. So Detective Carey was later implicated by a local gangster named Timothy Mello, and he was an associate of the Patriarcha crime family. Oh. If I'm saying that correctly. Kerry was named by Mello as having a connection to organized crime, and Kerry was also in trouble in 1983 with the Fall River PD for witness coercion. So, I mean, maybe he's not the most credible source. Oh my gosh, you just took the one guy who was maybe leaning on his version, and now that's just been sullied. 
Now, the thing is, Carl Drew's story has remained consistent over the years. He called himself a person who was into gothic ways, but has not, like, flat out admitted or denied being a Satanist at any time publicly. Well, it sounds like he was um, an asshole, you know, a known criminal to, you know, had done all these things. And it sounds like he used that image to his advantage, threatening people, you better do this or else. But did did he do all this other stuff? I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, police say he has admitted to being a Satanist and being part of the Satanic cult. However, Robin's, Robin Murphy, her story has changed frequently over the years. She's even denied involvement in 1995, saying that she didn't know anything at all about the murders. So she's a proven liar. Well, yeah, I mean, if your story changes over years of being, you know, incarcerated and that's all you got to think about is why and what put you there and all that mess, and it keeps changing, there's no reason for your story to ever change. This is what happened. You know, I've told you what happened. So if it keeps changing, that makes me wonder. Right. And she was paroled in 2004, but she violated parole in 2011 and was sent back to jail when she was found in a drug bust. They found, like, heroin in her car and that kind of thing. Now, there was no DNA testing at the time, so I think it's really hard to pinpoint the murderer. However, I mean, there was no physical evidence connecting Carl Drew to Karen Marsden's murder. But, I mean, And there's no they... DNA to go back and prove he was responsible for Karen or Doreen's murder. And I just think it would be really interesting to see what the verdict would be today in 2020. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it sounds like they're, they're, they're only kept part of the case. Their entire case is witness testimony. Circumstantial. And circumstantial. And I guess, you know, who that, that had to have been an evidence-rich scene. The way this went down, something like concrete's going to hold every fiber and you know, thing to it, uh, stuff like that. But I guess they just didn't have the technology to pull a lot of that evidence that was pro- likely available at this scene, both scenes. The counterculture satanic movement cropped up in the 1960s, and that did lead to the sensationalism of these murders. The media swooped in on the satanic elements and played it up, even though they were not key trial points. Like, instead of saying, like, this cult the court documents would just refer to it as, like, a group of people. (laughs) Well, yeah. Robin Murphy claimed to have been present at Barbara Raposa's murder, and Robin was known to drink and use drugs, so a lot of people think that maybe her reliability was not great, that she may not have even been there, or she may have been, but more active in the murder than she let on to be. Well, yeah. Robin not only agreed to testify against Carl Drew in the Karen Marsden murder, But she changed her story about what happened to Doreen Levesque. She claimed up until that point that Karen was present at the Levesque murder, and this seriously impacted Karen's mental state. She claims it's why Karen was murdered. But she also claims that both murders were sacrifices to Satan. Okay. That's a lot of claims. So that's kind of confusing. Yeah, like I said, uh, they were attacking, it seemed like they were attacking this Satanist thing or, or everyone who's telling their stories. Now, I'm, I don't even know what to believe anymore. I mean, I thought I had it figured out that Carl was this big monster, you know, and, and everyone else is along for the ride in different capacities. But now I'm not so sure. But, I mean, it really does seem like there likely was other motivations for these poor women being attacked. It sounds like you got kind of maybe a mob mentality, possibly. With this, you know, group of people acting. And um, I don't know. It just is. It's like these people with these personalities would have been okay if they were didn't end up together. I guess. Maybe. Well, like you said, Robin's assertions during the trial is that Carl Drew's criminal activities are carried out for Satan. That his power to wield others came directly from Satan. So he was getting money from the street crimes and power from Satan. So, yeah, it's like using Satan as an excuse to make money or as a way to make money to manipulate people. Okay. Like, the power of Satan compels you to be my sex worker. Yeah, I'd be like, no, dude, I I think your benefits and your uh, 
matching up to 10% on my 401k is why I came to be a sex worker for you. <laughs> well, speaking of Robin Murphy, I mean, she's a proven liar. In 1983, she claimed she had no knowledge of the Doreen Levesque murder, that she had only heard about it from Karen Marsden. But investigators who had spoken with Karen knew that Robin had also been involved because Karen said, yeah, she was there as well. In 2004, at a parole hearing, uh, Robin Murphy claims she had made up the stories to get Carl Drew off the streets because he was dangerous and that she just needed to get him put away. Ah, I see. So she was looking out for everybody else. And Andy's connection to Carl Drew was marginal. They seemed to kind of run in some of the same circles. But there's no evidence that Carl Drew had any association with the killing of Barbara Raposa. But he's been kind of, that, that murder has been grouped in with these other two murders. And he's even been attributed, like, if you look up his Murderpedia page, it lists Barbara as one of his victims. And so Andy, but Andy Carl, was convicted of Barbara's murder, yeah, right? and, and went to Drew jail. Yeah, and didn't have anything to do with that as far as investigators and evidence shows. So the only connection, even in your story, was when he told, Andy told them, oh, I know about this other stuff in this satanic cult. Yes. Okay. And it was almost like he was trying to pin her murder, maybe, on the satanic cult members. Like, maybe on Carl Drew. Oh, okay. But Drew didn't have anything to do with it. And just so you know, Andy died of cancer in prison, I think, in 1988. Carl is still in prison, and Robin Murphy is back in prison after that parole violation. But let's talk a little bit about Fall River's long connection to satanic rituals, specifically the Freetown Fall River State Park. They've got an image problem, and they need a Cracker Jack PR person to help. Call oh. me. I'm available. At her. At her. <laughs> exactly. The forest is 6,000 acres, which is about eight and a half square miles. It just gets crazy. So, November 14th of 1978, 15-year-old Mary Lou Aruda was found tied to a tree in the Freetown Forest. She had been missing since September of 1978. She was murdered, and they find her killer. His name is James Cater, and he's tried, arrested, you know, all that. He's in prison for her murder. In 1983, a healthy newborn male infant was abandoned off Route 24 and died of exposure. His parents were never identified. In 1987, a dog sled runner found the body of a Fall River drifter who was beaten, shot, and set on fire by four men who believed he was a police informant. Oh my God, dude. In 1988, two men were found naked and dead from gunshot wounds. That same year, the body of Elizabeth Gregory, a woman who had died in 1868, was stolen from her grave. She was buried in this very remote location inside this forest, and someone dug up her body. And okay. police believe it was some kind of cult activity. Yeah, so this is not that big of an area, right? As far, especially as far as national parks and state parks go, not that you know four square miles. That's not huge. Eight and a half. Eight and a half square miles, That's but six thousand acres. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, there is a lot of activity there, and this you know this place isn't that big. In nineteen ninety one, an eighteen year old was stabbed, beaten, and left for dead after a drug deal. He was found alive after three days, but he lost both of his legs to frostbite. So police in the area have investigated sexual assaults, physical assaults, murder, suicides, car burnings, animal mutilations, and other ritualistic activity in and around Freetown and the Fall River State Park. They describe it as basically a dumping ground. Oh, my God. I wonder if it's, it must be located, you know, maybe right off the road or right off busy highways or something. Yeah, it is. Okay. In 1988, officials reported an uptick in satanic symbols in the forest. Skulls were found. Pentagrams were carved in trees and specifically near a quarry in the forest. And that's where they believed that these, like, Satanists or cultists were gathering. In November of 1988, 12 calves were found butchered on the Fall River watershed land. 12 calves? Yeah. Well, that's what in the hell? Now the Satanists have like big pickup trucks and fucking livestock ca trailers? I mean, that's a lot of calves. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, suppose. Who even round? I mean, who had calf duty? You got to go probably steal the damn things. 
Well, I think they were like maybe grazing on this watershed land. Oh. And someone just showed up and butchered them all. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. See, that's how my brain works. Yeah, I know how your brain works. I was thinking, uh, how did you get the calves there? Yeah. They were just teleported to them. You know, some guys. It was one of those little magic grow like styrofoam things. You pour water on it and then it just like grew into like a calf. You know, I was at work and guys were talking about obscure laws. (laughs) (laughs) The obscure laws. I just meowed for a calf. They go moo, like a little baby moo. Meow. Yeah, so these guys at work, right quick, I'll say, were um, talking about obscure laws still on the books. Obscure state laws. Uh-huh. And one of them was you can't take a deer and water above its knee. And so my first thought is, um, of course, I don't know, maybe I'm sure listeners, some listeners know, that means you can't kill them. If you see a deer swimming across a lake, river, and, then, you know, the water's above their knee, you can't hunt them. You can't kill them. In my mind, I'm like, wow, getting a rope around that fucking deer's neck is going to be a pain in the ass. How are you going to do that? Like, I'm thinking, and like, then, like, lead, it lead the him river? into water, but you can't go above its knee. Well, you know, Dylan, they say you can lead a deer to water, but you can't make it think. <laughs> and um, I think that's perfect for you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so this area is also associated with the so-called Bridgewater Triangle which is a pretty popular area in Massachusetts for all sorts of strange activity, cryptids, UFOs, missing persons. Wow. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about the Bridgewater Triangle on Patreon. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was familiar. So, Satanic Panic of the 1970s and 80s definitely played into this story. I mean, there are many who say that the Fall River Satanic Cult never existed. But what we do know is that three women, all connected through their occupation as sex workers and perhaps involvement in these occult activities, led to their brutal murders under similar circumstances. So, it does seem that at least some kind of theistic Satanic Cult was active in Fall River at the time of these violent crimes. Sonny Sparta and others who were members denied any human sacrifices, but they did agree that there were some black mass gatherings that took place at the Freetown State Forest where sometimes goats and stray cats were killed. Okay. In mock baptisms, blood was poured over the heads of those in attendance. Now, theistic Satanism is a little different. Like, there are different sects of Satanism, if you're not familiar with this and theistic satanism is the literal worship of satan right right but many of the cult's activities seem to be more in line with what they'd seen in horror movies like you were asking me were they specifically performing like anton LaVey's satanic rituals right and you were like oh some of those were really in depth no this seems to be more like what they had seen in horror movies or what they thought was like some sort of satanic ritual and so, just were sort of like winging it. So they were just basically copying what they'd seen in pop culture and just um, no one was like a, a true student of. Right. These were not actual practices from like the Church of Satan. Okay. By any stretch. However, there are some that claim that this was merely a piece of a larger puzzle. That the Mary Lou Aruda murder, as well as the serial killer known as the New Bedford Highway Killer, are potentially tied to a diabolical network of underground Satanists in this area. Oh my God. And they're running the daycares too. Jesus. Well, I mean, when you think about all the strange things that have been happening in the state forest over the years... Well, I'm going to tell you what that is. The dumping ground. You've got the serial killer. Well, you have. Which we may cover the new Bedford Highway killer. You have real victims. That's very sad with the symbolism and stuff like that. I think it's just kids working off this legend, work, you know, all this stuff, especially during the satanic panic, you know, when it, everyone was talking about it and was everything was so sensationalized around it. It's just kids. Doing some, just like what you said, something they saw in a damn horror movie or something they think makes them anarchist or super goth outsiders or any of that shit. What do you think? Do you think goth kids go around sacrificing lambs or something? No, I'm just talking, I'm talking about. Because I did not do that as a goth kid. I was not singling anyone out. I do that as a goth adult. But it's these kids, certain kids, who are trying to be edgy, 
fringy, trying to scare, you know, scare, be super cool for their friends. So you draw, you get a pentagram tattooed on your ring finger, you know? And that's what, that's the kind of stuff you do to freak people out. You think so? Yeah. Well, I definitely think that for a state park and to be such a relatively small, like, park area in comparison to others, it does seem like there's a lot of strange activity there. Well, yeah. there And a lot of murders. Yeah. And as police described it as a dumping ground, I mean, I think that could just be proximity and location. As a realtor, location, 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 it's everything, right? Yeah, it's got good curb appeal. Right, so it's like a good curb appeal place to, like, dump your bodies. I don't know. Well, it's like the two naked men gunshot wounds. That sounds like some kind of either gang or mob vendetta. Someone getting in the black market or someone who crossed someone, and they've been taken out there and killed. And, uh, yeah, and it sounds like you said it's close to some major roads and highways, and you can zip off the road. And but still be kind of in a private area, you know, very quickly. So it's a perfect place for some maniac to dump a victim. Right. And some of the things I read online were saying, oh, okay, well, yeah, and it does have this dark history. And there have been some really strange and unusual events happen there. But for the most part, it's a safe place, especially during the day. People camp, hike, ride bikes, take walks. I mean, it's not like a dangerous spot. That's no more dangerous than any of these types of places are going to be at any given moment. I mean, hell, Gary Hilton came right through our damn mountains here, buddy. That's true. We might have walked on some trails that he was on. We probably have. Man, I would punch that old ass dude. You're going to need more than a damn police baton and and some shit like that, dude. I'm going to kick you in the face, old dude. You think so? Well, if he pulls a gun out, what are we going to do? Die fighting. Um, we're going to die fight. You're damn right. You ain't going to drive me attitude. around in a fucking van and well, I've kill said my that. wife. If somebody grabbed me, they're going to have to kill me before they even get me in a vehicle. That's right. Because I'm going to assume they're going to kill me anyway. So I will fight them before they have an opportunity to put me in the vehicle. Like, they'll have to kill me before they get me in there. Right. So you're going to be dead in front of the middle school. Yeah, pretty much. On the sidewalk. Or knock my ass out to get me in that van. But I'm not getting in that vehicle with you. No, because nothing good's going to no. happen once you're forced in a vehicle. I don't care who you are or where you're at. Remember that. Don't get in the vehicle. Do I mean, that? this is where you draw the line. This is the thin red line, right? No, I've already got. In the sand. I've already mapped this out in my head. I'm down with you. How things go down? Yeah. I mean, I've already told you my self-defense move. People never think of this. I go for the lower half of the body, right? She attacks her thighs. If you attack, yeah, you attack somebody like at the ankles, you fucking knock them off balance. Yeah. What can they do? Well, it's true. Yeah. They could get tangled up in you and fall down. I'm going to be open. like booty blocking. I'm going to be hip checking. I'm going to be going for some lower body derby moves because that's how I know that you knock somebody down. Okay. And I'm a small person, right? I mean, I'm fat, but I'm short. So I got to like do what I can. You're with strong. What, I, with what I'm working with here. Yeah, your little hip derby move, a hip thrust thing hurts and you do it to me all the time. Well, don't fuck with me. Hashtag him, too. See, nobody can send me to a penalty box now, Dylan. Yeah, so never remember that, folks. You heard it here on Mountain Murders. Don't get in the fucking car. Draw the line in the sand. Either they're going to make it or you're going to make it, but you're not going in the vehicle. So through all of this, I'm not sure I find Carl Drew the most responsible party. I mean, he's serving a life sentence for these murders or for this Karen Marsden murder. But I'm not 100% sure he was responsible for it. I'm not. That is a, a very interesting story you I laid out like there. I feel like maybe Robin Murphy is the, the real player in all this. I think at the very least they're equally responsible and it, that she should not have been paroled. Right? I mean, I'm not sure to what level. But, I mean, just, you know, after one of these events happen, no matter who's telling the truth, you go to the fucking cops, dude, and you tell them, look, this crazy shit happened, and, you know, this person needs to be, they need to pay. They need to be, you know, in jail, and whatever trouble I get into, you know, maybe we can work out some immunity. I'll be your star witness. That's how that's supposed to work if you have any kind of a conscience, but they kept on and on and on, so whoever did the least or, you know, whoever did more, I think uh, they could they could have stopped it. Well, I they think could have stopped it. one of the parts of the story that 
blows my mind is that if Robin Murphy is as responsible as I'm leaning and believing that she is, she was fucking 17. Can you imagine a 17 year old being that manipulative and just fucking evil? You know what? I mean, you know what I could imagine creating that is some poor little 11 year old girl who's molested by this sicko and over and over and goes straight into a life of prostitution on the streets taking care of herself. So, I mean, I guess that's pretty fucking horrible and traumatic. So, I mean, I guess maybe you end up with someone who just doesn't give a fuck. Like Eileen Warnos. Yes, exactly. Basically. Basically. It Even seems younger to me version. that, like, Murphy, if she were out and about, like, I kind of feel like she's someone who would kill again. Well, you know, she, my God, I mean, I just can't even imagine what you would, what that would do to you. You know, she's still so young and to be done like that and just humans and men and in the prostitution game on top of that and just seeing the worst version of men, you know, creeps and all this shit and being mean to women and just treated like shit. Well, you know, I mean, you make my a God. great point, Dylan, because I look at her and I think, God, you have to be so evil. To She's, be doing that at 17? But you're exactly right, Dylan, and she was a victim in all of this as well. Yeah, I mean, that's... And that's the part that we're, you know, I mean, I am failing to think of. Thank you for reminding me, because she is a victim in well, all I of mean, this. Well, I mean, you you reminded me as well that, I mean, it would take something like that to make. She's possibly the monster we think she was at 17. That could make make that of a woman. I mean, or anyone, a man or a woman. Yeah, I mean, there's this big part of me that always feels really, um, I mean, when I look at the serial killers, like the Gacy's and Ted Bundy, I'm like, fuck those guys. But I do have this, like, soft spot almost for, like, Eileen Wernos. Well, I mean. Because her life was so fucking terrible that she was a victim for so long that it's like, no wonder she became a monster. Well, I mean, how could you not? I mean, it's definitely one way your brain is going to survive. You know, your brain's going to go in different directions and you're going to have different types of personalities after these traumas. And, um, I mean, a lot of us know some of the popular, you know, routes people go. But, yeah, I mean, becoming a fucking monster is a, a route that you can go. Your brain can do that. And, I mean, you, it's hard to say, but you can't almost, you understand that why they did that, you know? Yeah, I think the other one that I kind of have a little bit of like a, a feel like a little tiny violin play for them and don't at me, Jeffrey Dahmer. Because he just seems so fucking lonely and sad. I have to say it. I mean, uh, you know, poor victims of Dahmer's. I mean, you never can forget there's quite a few. Well, no. I mean, and what and, he did was terrible. And what he did was terrible. But, but I guess when I look at the big picture of Dahmer, I just... There's part of me that kind of feels like empathy for him or something because he he just seemed like such a fucking sad, lonely person. His goal was... He just wanted somebody to, like, be with him. Someone to stay. I mean, how fucking... You know, someone to just stay with him. And he him. went about this in, like, the wrong way. The total okay? wrong, yes. Now, I'm not saying that what he did was okay. I'm no. just saying, like, I, I like, it was horrible. sorry for him because he just really wanted somebody to just be with him. It's almost like them dying was just a byproduct product of what he was doing, which is horrible. And they were tortured and all that is a byproduct of what he was trying to accomplish. And it's just, it's almost like a Shakespearean tragedy yeah. of sorts, you know, the irony and everything. Fuck. We're, and we're not, we're not pro Dahmer. Okay, guys. No, not at all. No. And it's really fucked up. And another sad thing I think of every time I hear Dahmer's name or story is that poor kid who made it out of the apartment. And then the fucking cops took him and, right and, in and the apartment. Then, yeah. All Dahmer's got to do. Cause everyone's so homophobic back then. Like, oh, I was my gay. And they're like, Oh God. Yeah. You know, you, you take care of that. But that poor victim made it to cops. And that's so sad. And, was and they gave down. him back to the man who'd been fucking assaulting him. Lobotomizing him. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm not sure he's part of this conversation, but yeah, I mean, maybe. <laughs> okay, so that has been the Fall River Satanic Cult story. 
And I'm sorry if I jumped around a little bit. I was trying to think of the best way to tell the story because there's so much information and this cast of characters. Well, I mean, I think you get, we got the gist of it and and you laid it out there to where you're not going to really, you know, you might have more questions than answers at the end of the story. I certainly do. I have more. So thanks, Stephanie, for suggesting that. It was a great story just in time for Halloween. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. That was a great story, definitely. We will be back on Wednesday with a brand new Offbeat episode. Make sure you download that. Check it out. And if you have any uh, story suggestions or just want to say, hey, hit us up at mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok.